W225BD Statesville. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest. From the racing world with their stories, their paths, their, their racing, racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Now here's our host, David Ham. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. Right here on 550 AM and 92.9 FM. And DHAM I am on YouTube if you want to see us. Join us here in the studio and uh, ask your questions and put comments on here for us. So we're excited about tonight because we got Deb Williams in. And this is my first time meeting Deb, but it's a friend of Phil's. He worked with her <laughs> back in the day, I guess you could say, right, Deb? Right, well, Phil? yeah. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because we started a few years ago, yeah, yeah but uh, when we started out together, he was a freelance photographer with us at Winston Cup Scene. And then when Griggs Publishing sold Winston Cup Scene to American City Business Journals and it became NASCAR Winston Cup Scene, Phil became the photo editor of it and I became the editor of it. So we had a lot of interesting times together. I bet so. Y'all, I mean, yeah. and y'all seen a lot of uh, wonderful NASCAR history. Yeah, the best of times, times too. Yeah. We, oh, I, yeah. We always, I guess at the time we didn't realize it was somewhat fade away like it has as far as in our minds of the big names and stuff, you know. I, well, we were so busy meeting deadlines, and I mean, it was so critical. And you know, this was before digital photography, and we'd have yeah. to stay up processing film all night. And then when they went to night races, it was changing that way as well. And you don't realize just how special the times are until you get back and then you look at them. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of special times, special moments, and. You know, I just feel very fortunate that we were in racing at the time we were because it was when it was growing and the world was discovering it, and it was a very special time. Yeah. So about what year did you start in, in NASCAR or working for the newspaper? Well, actually, I was covering – started covering NASCAR Cup racing when I was the United Press International in 1979. Okay. But before that – I actually started covering racing when I was the sports editor at the newspaper in Waynesville, North Carolina, and would cover the Friday night weekly races at Asheville Motor Speedway, which a lot of people I'm sure have seen on Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s Lost Speedway section. So yeah. that's where I started covering races, mm -hmm. and but I grew up around it. You okay. know, my parents were big race fans. My parents were going when my mother was pregnant with me. The only place they could get me to quit crying and sleep till I was a year old was under the loudspeaker in the infield at Asheville Weaverville <laughs> when it was dirt. Yeah. So, you know, I knew by the time I was 13 years old that I wanted to be a motorsports rider. Okay. So that was my objective. Yeah. But, yeah, I started covering it in 1979 for United Press International. And then when I left UPI at the end of 84, I was with Sunbelt Video on the first year of the TV show Inside NASCAR as a writer and reporter, mm -hmm. and then joined Griggs Publishing in 86, and that's that started my 18-year tenure with that publication. How about that? That's your story in a nutshell. That's it. <laughs> I should have I started out the intro with that. The name of Daryl, Daryl Watcher, Richard Petty, Rusty Austin, Bill, <laughs> Irvin Gordon, Earnhardt, Smith, Deb, Junior. Because <laughs> you sucked on worked. a yeah, like yeah. you sucked on a valve off a Goodyear tire. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you started really young going to the races. Yeah, yeah. That's so. good. I think you're only a, maybe a year older than me or something like that. So uh, I started young. You started young. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's a North Carolina girl. Can yeah, Canton, North Carolina. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, it's unfortunately been in the news a lot lately with the floods yeah. that we had there, mm -hmm. and they're working to get it, you know, worked out and, yeah, they, and get everything finished. They were still searching for one person today that was missing. Just over a foot of rain, wasn't it? They had. Oh, yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, the the river, the Pigeon River Road all, rose almost 17 feet in less than 10 hours. So wow. it was uh, definitely terrible. I was wondering how it was doing because you go out to Pigeon Forge, which we love going to, and, and there's, uh, the, let's see, the Margaritaville Restaurant, whatever. There's a lot of them right there on that Pigeon River. Well, that would be down past where the flash flooding occurred. Okay, back up to the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah, but the flash flooding in north carolina and i'm not talking about the bad flooding in tennessee yeah that too but the one in north carolina 
it would be up Crusoe as if you were going to Mount Pisgah mm. and up Lake Logan like you were going to Cold Mountain. Oh. And so that was the area of Haywood County that was in. And then, of course, the Pigeon River comes right down through Canton and mm-hmm. by the high school and the football stadium and everything for Pisgah. So when I watched the movie Cold, Cold Mountain, then I could think about you. Is, have you seen that movie? Well, I'm familiar with it. I've seen okay. parts of it, but the person who yeah. wrote the book yeah. is actually from Haywood County. Spooky movie. Yeah, it is, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard it to can be a spooky out, place at nighttime, I too, sure. up yeah. on the Blue Ridge yeah. Parkway. I'm sure. So I wanted to say a couple of things. Well, of course, I got Tracy sitting over here, right. and uh, she's going to be taking your questions and, and such. So if you've got a question, put it on there and put a big Q in front of it, if you would, so she can see it a little bit better. And uh, But I wanted to mention couple things today one is uh, kenny wallace's birthday so maybe he's tuned in i forgot to send him the link but i was kind of busy today with, with doing a lot of different things but um well happy birthday kenny yeah yeah and i'm sure he's partying and having a good time always yeah, probably he used to racing. hey he and kim used to have great new year's eve parties mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. oh yeah kind of like, i know hut strickland did but kenny's not lived around here or Hut does, so I could always Well, Kenny, this was back not long after Kenny and Kim moved here, and they oh. built their house and mm-hmm. all, and they had it over there and oh, yeah, behind the know. house on the, off of 73. Okay, yeah. When they lived over there. That's right. I did actually forgot. He did. He lived out that way, but I never did go over there. And the other thing was uh, we lost Tom T. Hall, um, yeah. but his son, oh, did you know his no. son that used to, ja- he was a jack man. I love little well, yeah. ducks. So oh, yeah, Tom T. Hall is great. He yeah, passed away th- Friday. Three days oh, ago. I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. we played a couple songs for him this morning. I'm sorry, what were you saying about his son, David? His son is a Dean Hall, and he worked with the uh, Travis Carter team oh, okay. over there. And he was that. a jack man. Oh, wow. Because really? okay. I remember that. I remember wow. finding out from somebody else. Cause was he a was, Carolina guy, Tom? Um, yeah. Mm, that's a good question. Anyways. Anyways. Yeah. Back to Deb Williams. So, Can't so, North Carolina's uh, finest. But, uh, <laughs> North Carolina's finest here, Deb Williams. But I just want to mention that because that yeah, is kind of related yeah. to NASCAR since, you know. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. And, all right. And, and the other thing is stick around after this. If you might have saw the little preview uh, video here, premiere, whatever. I did want, I put one together to play as a premiere right after this is over. It should start immediately. And it's a four minute long. And it's whenever I had Donnie Allison in here. And he was tell. I always have to ask about Marty Robbins because I love mm, Marty Robbins mm-hmm. as a country music singer. And knowing that he oh, was definitely. involved in NASCAR was great. Yeah. And so I put together a little video about Donnie talking about Marty, and I put some pictures on there and stuff. Oh, cool. Well, you know, um, Ray Everham restored one of Marty Robbins' cars, mm-hmm. and it's really neat. And it was neat. I think Marty's son maybe drove that around the Nashville Fairgrounds wow. Speedway after Ray Everham got it restored. Oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Um, I, I actually saw that when I was at Charlotte Motor Speedway a few months ago, and it was it's the one with the Mountain Dew on the hood, the top, and the back trunk lid, and then it's got the Marty's regular 22 and the purple and yellow kind of on the sides. Mm, the purple and yellow. Yeah. yeah. I put together a little video of that, but it was, he bought it from Junior Johnson to in 1982 because okay. he was really wanting to beat Marty, or he was really wanting to beat Bobby at Nashville was like his dream, mm-hmm. you know. And so he got he went he went like 96 laps. And then Bobby passed him and won the race right at the very end, <laughs> which is kind of sad. But anyway, it is. But there's also that story, too, of when Marty was racing at the Nashville Fairgrounds and he was doing really well. But he had to stop in order to get to the Grand Ole Opry on time to mm. perform that night, too. So that was bad. Yeah, that is bad. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing you'll see in this video. Donnie was talking about how they would leave and take off to to the Grand Ole Opry and go watch him. Yeah. Man, those were some good times back then, you know? Yeah. I, mm. I guess that was still in Ryman Auditorium then when right. they had the Grand yeah. Ole Opry. Yep. Yeah, I have to brag on my cousin and my sister because they danced on that stage at Ryman Auditorium for the Grand Ole mm. Opry when I was a child. Really? Yeah, nice. with a dance team out of Asheville. What was Clogging their name? team. You know their name? Who, my sister or the dance the, team? The team, yeah. There's, you know, I don't remember... Yeah. For some reason, Southern Appalachian clogger sticks, sticks in my mind, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's correct. Okay. But they were out of Asheville, and of course, we had the dance team for all ages at the Y, and my sister and cousin and I were all on our dance team at the Y, so whenever they needed a substitute, they would call over there. Did you have these uh, tap shoes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I was fascinated by the. <laughs> uh, I had I had my mom drug me to my sister's rehearsals when I was a kid, mm. which I couldn't stand it. But anyway, 
Um, but those little tap shoes, I was always fascinated by them. I bet you wore them too, didn't you? <laughs> well, oh, the, no, the, the, the tap shoes, you know, if you cl- if you yeah. clog or buck dance, it was buck dancing with my parents when they won the semifinals of the hmm. Western North Carolina Square Dancing Championship. But uh, if you do it correctly, you really don't need taps on your shoes. But if you do oh. clogging the way it is done now, then you need the taps on oh, your shoes. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's neat. I played the harmonica at the Grand Ole Opry. Oh, good for you. That's yes. fabulous. Thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. He still well, does. He got his photo made. Well, <laughs> spoiler, spoiler alert. Yes, I took, I did the tour, and so I got my picture taken. Nobody else was in. The, nobody was in the audience, but that's okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Still the Grand Ole Opry. You can tell him it was sold out crowd. That's it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a question. I mean, yeah. you said you were lulled to sleep at Asheville Speedway as uh-huh. a child. Were you there? Were your parents there just watching the race? I yes. don't know that. If you have any background of, of relatives that race, like my uncle raced. Well, Bosco Lowe was in high school with my sister. And Bosco and my cousin, Jean Barnett, were big friends. And they were around together all the time. And they actually started a car club in Canton called the Asphalt Gladiators. And what they promoted car safety and maintaining your car if anybody had trouble on the highways they would stop and help them and they always put on the car show on labor day of course labor day was a big celebration with this being a mill town Mm -hmm. and so they always put on the car show the asphalt gladiators did and of course bosco went the racing he was known as the he was nicknamed the Canton Kid over at Asheville Speedway when oh, okay. it was Jack Ingram and Bob Presley and Harry Gant and all them Ned mm-hmm. Setzer, and then my cousin went the show car circuit, and my cousin won top rod in the nation in 1972 hmm. with his roadster that he had designed and created, and it was known as Sweet Thing, was its name, and he got an Adventure GT12 for the the prize that year, and I kept trying to get him to. Let me drive the Avenger, Avenger GT12, but he never would. That was nice of him to name his car after you, though. Oh, well, that was sweet. I, I think at that age, though, I probably wasn't. <laughs> You're like my sister. She's four years older than me, but I thought she was the devil. <laughs> uh, but well, she's the sweetest thing in the world now, I guess. So. Well, my sister's 11 years older than me, and I oh, was an aggravating little sister. I'm sure. I mean, you know, just because... <laughs> David speaks from experience. He was yeah. aggravating, too. Uh, I guess, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tracy's just ruining all the good stuff for me I'm tonight. I'm not ruining it. I'm just keeping it real. Keeping it real. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. If you're just tuning in, we got Deb Williams uh, right here on Racing Roots with Ham. And so she worked uh, with the NASCAR or Winston Cup scene. Did I get that right? I mean, well, I, it, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, was it, you know, it, it kind of metamorphosis a lot because mm-hmm. it started out as Grand National scene and then it became Winston Cup scene, then it became NASCAR Winston Cup scene. And then after Phil and I were no longer associated with it, it became NASCAR scene. Yeah, I think that's when so, I lost it, when it was when it went to the NASCAR Winston Cup scene. Or was that the magazine? That was, no, that was Illustrated. It illustrated was, was the, the magazine. Yeah, yeah. Illustrated, yeah. You're yeah. Right. Okay. And, um, See, they didn't, American City Business Journals bought Winston Cup scene at the end of the 1992 season. And mm-hmm. then they bought Illustrated, I want to say probably May. 94, 95. Yeah. Because there were a couple of years year before they so, bought yeah. it. Yeah. So it was, um, it went over there. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, Ben White was in charge of it. So I'm not really too sure about how it progressed we had of our hands full with seen in the newspaper and it, yeah. it grew so much i know when rob griggs sold scene to american city business journals i want to say circulation was about seventy thousand, mm. and then by the end of 2003 it was at one hundred forty thousand a week that's that's uh, crazy numbers there hey that's great. how about that look at that hundred thousand and growing now, i'm gonna are. bring this over to death yeah. Because I had most of the people that signed it at the time. I was with the scene, and you never signed it. But isn't that, remember that? We had that made up at 100,000. I had forgotten 000. all about yeah, that. You sign that right there, lady. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had these T-shirts made up, 100,000. Because what was it, at, at 73,000 when we started there in 93? About 70,000. 70, yeah, because 000. we lost around... 
Uh, we lost around 2,000 to 2,500 subscribers when Richard Petty retired at the end of 1992. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, the reason was they said that, you know, they had followed Richard since 1958, mm -hmm. and they could get all the racing news now that they wanted without in-depth. They weren't as interested in following it in-depth now that Richard had retired. So oh, we okay. lost about 2,000 to 2,500 then. So whenever, let's just say, when, when Earnhardt passed away, did you, well, the, did you, were you still there then, 2001? Yeah, I was still there. Okay. I don't think we lost any then. Okay. But. 147,000. 140,000, yeah. Weekly. At that time, it was the largest auto racing newspaper in the country. Very good. I, I actually, I used to, um, I still have some. I showed them to Phil, uh, the, ones that, the ones that I found that I had stockpiled yeah. in my, in a box for, mm -hmm. I don't know, 20, 20 years ago. Rick Houston 25. has every issue, I believe, right? I I don't know. I have every issue through 2003. Okay. Oh, well. So that picture that I used in our thumbnail, it's, that's one I got from, uh, I saw that on Rick Houston's stuff. It's just a, them laid out. This one's got Earnhardt on it, which is one I have. Uh, and then uh, Davey Allison and another mm -hmm. one. Yeah. I thought that'd be an appropriate background image for that. Yeah. Yeah, my sister was listening. She said, I heard that. She's laughing. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's, got, she's got some stories about Earnhardt and Allison, which she could share. You know, what sure. was interesting was the letters, how different the letters were that we received after we lost Davey in comparison to the letters we received after we lost Alan Kowicki. We The amount of letters were about the same, but the content of them were very different in that a lot of the letters we received for, for Alan Kowicki after we lost him were talking about how much of an inspiration he had been. Like one person decided to go back to and get a college degree because of Alan, and another person who had a small business didn't think that he could compete with larger businesses, and yet Alan showed him he could. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it gave him the incentive to go back and, and do that. Whereas the letters we received on Davy, people were talking about how much they would miss seeing Davy smile in Victory Lane and seeing him with his children. It was just totally different from yeah, I'm sure. the way they were. Right, yeah. I could definitely see that. I know uh, Alan Quickies was like, his song was I Did It My Way. Exactly. He to, to, to Polish Lap and when he won a championship. And, and that was interesting because you know, R.J. Reynolds wanted those who were contending for the championship to tell them what songs they wanted for the video before the Atlanta race so that they could have it and have the rights cleared and everything. Mm -hmm. And Alan did not want to tell Tom Roberts what it was because he was afraid he would jinx it yeah. if he did that. <laughs> and so when they were in Atlanta and they were doing the pre-race PR media tours, mm -hmm. and Ty Norris was with R.J. Reynolds in, and he was bugging T.R. for it, and T.R. was bugging Alan, and Alan didn't want to give it to him, and <laughs> they got to the last deal of the day, and as T.R. was getting out of the car, Alan looked at him, and he said, My Way by Frank Sinatra, and it has to be the one by Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about that? Wow. So. Yeah, so I remember the one when, like, Robert Yates, they, they went, we are the champion, the Queen song. Yeah. I just, whatever. Mm-hmm. That was back then. I don't yeah. know if they still do that kind of stuff anymore, do you think? No. You know, I haven't been to a banquet since it left the Waldorf in New York. I'd love to go to the one this year in Nashville, Tennessee. Me either. But I haven't, I never went to one when it was in Las Vegas. Neither did I. I went, the last one I went to was uh, Matt Kenseth's in New York. Okay. Yeah. The last one I went to was 2005 in New York. Okay. okay. All right. 2003, 2005. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. That was, I always talked about how special that was to be in New York at, at winter time. Yeah. You know, go by the skate and rink and through the store. The Rockefeller Center. And the parties after the, the, it broke up. You know, upstairs in all the rooms, you'd get lost where you were at. And, oh, yeah. You know, it was a lot of fun. You'd hear the biggest, the wildest stories about who was doing what to what driver at the room. And 
you know. <laughs> well, it had always yeah. been a private party. The Champions Party had always been private mm -hmm. until the year Rusty won it. And that's when they took it to the racing community who was right, there. Yeah. And then, of course, when Alan won it, what he mm. kept saying was he wanted his party to be better than Rusty's. That's what he wanted. And, of course, they got Jack Mack in the heart attacks. Okay. And they all, what was funny at that party was watching them pool their money together to see, to get the band to play longer because oh, they didn't yeah. want them stopping at the time and yeah. they were needing more money. And here everybody was down on the dance floor pool, pooling money together to, yeah. to pay them for the extra well. time. That's one yeah. thing you see a lot in NASCAR is uh, work hard, play hard. Like, you know, especially when the season's over. Oh, yeah. Well, that's like at the yeah. scene, we had the luxuries of being invited to all those parties. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. And those Earnhardt parties with Del McCowart and stuff, or not Del McCowart, but uh, Delbert Burton? Delbert. Uh, Delbert McClinton? Delbert McClinton, he had at one of his. I remember that was incredible. Well, were you there when they were having the deals? the concerts when tnn was televising the races and they were having the concerts at the rose room yeah and the first reba one was McIntyre. reba mcintyre yeah. and yeah. the second one was faith hill yeah. and yeah. then we had um, of course we always had brooks and dunn mm -hmm. when yeah. earnhardt won the championship yeah. they would just be there and they were there in atlanta usually when he won yeah well that concert with alabama the last yeah. night before richard petty's final race in the georgia yeah. dome was fantastic yeah yeah, I ran, they got a song. Uh, is it Sunday Money? I think it is. Uh, Brooks and Dunn. But I got to meet them at, at uh, Indianapolis. I believe it was they came because they were on our Coors car when I was the Jack Man in '99. Okay. With Sterling. Yeah. 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 So, uh, all right, but my uncle Randy's listening now, and I think he would like to hear at some point an Earnhardt story. But we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. And we're going to take another break in about 30 minutes, and then there'll be no more breaks till the end of the show. So we're going to do that right quick, and we'll be back right back to Racing Roots with Ham and Deb Williams. Stay tuned. Scott here with Randy Marion in Statesville. Tell us about your pre-owned cars. Billy Buck, let me ask you something. If you were going to buy a pre-owned vehicle, wouldn't you want to buy with confidence? That is what Randy Marion here in Statesville has. We have got our certified pre-owned programs with Chevrolet, Ford, and Lincoln. What does that give you, the buyer, on that next pre-owned car or truck? It gives you confidence as that vehicle has been checked bumper to bumper. We have great incentivized rates to make that purchase even better. Certified pre-owned. Check them out today. Randy Marion Chevrolet and Stasel and Randy Marion Ford Lincoln. Come see us today. Hello, this is Dr. Jesse Stroud, pastor of Fern Hill Baptist Church, located at 872 Fern Hill Road, Mooresville, North Carolina, inviting you to listen to our broadcast on Sundays at 1230 on WAME. I would also like to invite you, if you don't have a church home, to come visit with us. Speaking of, we're silent on the YouTube because I always have to kill the volume because it seems like every week I get hit with a, it's not really a copyright strike, but it's just one of those, your video cannot be monetized, which these don't make part of anything anyway, because it's not really like sponsor friendly. I mean, whatever it is, but it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's why I do that because last week, and what, the reason why I do it is because I don't want to cut the song out. I don't want it to be there, but if I cut it out, then I'll lose it any comments that are made on the video 
And to me, that's like we're, we're documenting a little bit of history here. And the comments are important to me. So of course they are. You know, it's like, gosh, I have to do it. But anyway, so I just avoid that by hitting the volume. Mm-hmm. And that kills it. So, yeah, as I mentioned, um, I think we should get get into some some uh, stories. But what we usually do is we just start out with asking you your history. You know, like where were you born and raised and all that kind of stuff. How'd and you we, get your start? Yeah, and we and like who your big influence was when and you know what like your dad was a big NASCAR fan or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then that he also was a machinist and had a love of cars. He was machinist in the paper mill for 45 years. Okay. So, and he had a love of cars and I grew up around ball fields and car garages and service stations and horse shows and moonshine. No, neither one of my parents <laughs> drank or smoked, well, but just, my my uncle did run Moonshine, yeah. Okay, there you go. I had an uncle that ran Moonshine, <laughs> yeah. but that was before I came along. Yes. Yeah. Statute of limitations is gone. Yeah, he's dead. He's out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't put him in jail now. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah, and, and so I mentioned my uncle listening in, and, uh, you know, you were, uh, he's a big Earnhardt fan. He was such an Earnhardt fan that he had a picture of him hanging in his living room, and it's probably still there. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think he said it is. Anytime I took him to the racetrack, he was take a lot of pictures of Earnhardt. And he had the old, it was a 35-millimeter camera film back then. Yeah. 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 And I can't imagine not having, like, a digital card to take out and Yeah, sift through. this day and age, you have one digital card that will hold about 2,000 photos before it was one roll of film. And there's plenty of people that will tell you when they shot for the scene there was a strict – you better make that shot count, you know, two sure. rolls of film for the whole weekend. Mm-hmm. And it was me, I could shoot a lot more, and my partner, Chad Fletcher, the hero, he mm-hmm. could shoot as much as we want because we were full-time employees. We had to handle the workload, so, we, you know. Yeah, tell them how you handled the film coming back from Japan when we had that uh, race there. I don't even remember. We put it on the flight with somebody. Who, with a crew. With the crew that went, which crew? I want to say, was it Will Lynn? With Childress? I think it was, yes. We put it with Will, and yeah. and I'm pretty sure Will Lynn had brought all our film back from the exhibition race in Japan. Yeah. And Chad picked it up at the airport, airport at Charlotte the, Douglas the when they landed. Yeah. And you got it back, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we did that, on, we did that a we lot. We did a lot. Oh, okay, Especially good. Daytona during Speed Weeks. We had oh, yeah. one person designated as the rabbit, and it would either be – you know, somebody that was really quick at getting it to the airport on a Delta Dash flight, mm-hmm. and we'd send 20 or 30 rolls from that day mm-hmm. back and chat or whoever was there to get it off the plane, would process it and lay it all out and lay the paper out. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's crazy. I I took my 8 millimeter camcorder to Japan the first time, so I put a video on my YouTube channel. I've, yeah, it's good. It. It's good. It's a good like documentation. Well, of history. it's great because a lot of those memories you forget that big park and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. You you covered a lot of it. it yeah. 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 So it's uh so yeah it's pretty cool and uh, I had an eight millimeter camcorder so it was the tape in there of course and whenever you stop it it would automatically back up so that there was no gaps. Oh, that's cool. It is, but I didn't realize it because I was kind of new to the filming thing then. Uh-huh. You know, it was nineteen ninety six, mm-hmm. and so. Everything I did, it was like I'll show a scene and then it jumps straight to the next scene, and then I'll show a scene, you know, which mm-hmm. is good for nowadays because that's the attention span of people, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> eight seconds maximum, and and so, uh, but but looking at it, I'm like, gosh, I wish I'd have went a little bit further. Like the Mac Tool Man, you could just see him as a different Japanese Mac Tool Man uh-huh. in his truck and he's waving and smiling, and you know, stuff like that. I got him at least. That's right. So that's right. I could actually all, always digitally, I could pause, and and then you could look at a picture of him, you know, something. But anyway, that was a, a different time. It's a good thing we got digital now. Now you just oh, got your phone and take a video. Yeah, that that really helps a guy like me. Yeah. When the PR person comes up, you're ready to shoot a pit stop, and they put their camera phone in front of you to take it. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's aggravating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. No, I you're a, yeah. So you could be accused, accused of being a spy or something, too, at times. But that goes into a whole other thing. That, yeah, that's a whole other era. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, speaking of, let's say Earnhardt. How was your – I know Phil had some good experiences with Earnhardt, you know, like getting the champagne dumped in his – you know, what he's pulling his hair and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. which is actually a really cool story. Um, but what is your experiences? Oh, Deb's been around, around a lot longer. She's got some – 
stories, probably when Earnhardt was just a young and still. Well, you got to understand that Ralph Earnhardt, his dad, drove for a couple in Canton that went to high school with my mother and dad. Okay. And they were best friends. Mm. So the first race car that I ever got to touch and look into, I was about probably four years old, and I had to pull myself up and look in it. And it was Ralph Earnhardt's. It was sitting in front of Presley Garage at the foot of the Canton Hill, which was run by Frank and Mike Presley. Hmm. And Earnhardt and them would stay with Frank and Hilda. In fact, Dale's mother, Martha, was at this was visiting Hilda and Frank the day that Ralph had his fatal heart attack hmm. in Canton. Yeah. But as far as knowing Dale, I really didn't know him till I started covering the sport. And you know, he had a good relationship with the people at scene, and, and we had one with him as well. And, of course, I guess the reason Dale and I got along, you know, Dale, and, and I think Phil will attest to this, Dale would see if he could intimidate you, if he could run all over you, just like he would on the racetrack. And if he found out he couldn't, then he respected you. Yep, yeah. And... See that. The funny story that always comes to my mind, and a lot of people will probably remember the all-star race when Rusty and Dale wrecked, and Dale was pinned up against the wall there on the front stretch at Charlotte, and a lot of the fans got out and were pouring beer on Earnhardt in the car before he could get out of the car. Ooh. And so when he and Rusty got back to the garage, and of course, they're talking to each other and everybody is trying to hear you got media like two and three deep yeah trying to hear and of course it's dark in the garage and rusty and dale are talking well i'm so short and it was dark i just went around behind them and stuck my tape recorder up between the two of them and got everything they were saying on tape. All right. So that was my sidebar. (laughs) Yeah. So I wrote it. Well, the next week, used to, that's when you had qualifying on Thursday, and then you'd have at-track practice on Friday. Well, it was raining, and Kevin Triplett was working for NASCAR at the time, and Kevin and I were standing underneath the overhang from the NASCAR trailer. You know how you'll feel like somebody's watching you? Mm-hmm. And I looked up, and Dale's standing there, and he's looking down at me while Kevin and I are talking to each other. And when I looked up at him and saw him, no, he didn't no, motion for me. No. He didn't use the Richard Petty finger. He did that to me. No, he just looked down at me, and he said, you made me look bad. Oh. I said, what did I do? You yeah. said I wrecked Rusty. Well, that's what you said. I did not. Well, I've got it on tape. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> nah, that's okay. Uh, so. And turn around and walk back in the NASCAR hauler. Yeah. So. He probably had that smirk, too. Because yeah. he knew, he knew you, you got him on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's a good story yeah. there. But yeah, he was uh, he was special. That whole family is special. Yeah. So now uh, Junior's doing good. I think <clears throat> I think it was a good thing that, in my personal opinion, that he he got let's say got out of the car and now he's doing the stuff that he's doing, which he seems to be enjoying it mm-hmm. with the commentating and, and his uh, Dirty Mo podcasting and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So I'm pretty you, sure he watches. Do you think he'll ever own a cup team? They are, they say that if they do, it won't be until 2023. Hmm. Think it'll be Childress? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> that is a Sorry. good question. Sorry. You just never know. <laughs> Get a hairball. <laughs> <laughs> no, I honestly hadn't thought of it. That's, that's a good and do question. You think, uh, do you think there's any rumor to JTG selling to Harvick? Well, let's, let's go back here just a minute. Let's, let's back up just a minute. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when you people have got to remember, okay, first of all, you got to look at Junior Motorsports may. There's a good possibility that team may have five entries in the Xfinity Series next year. There's not a limit on the number of teams you can have in Xfinity and truck mm-hmm. like there is Cup. Okay, I didn't know that. So you can only have four, as you know, in Cup. Mm-hmm. Well. We know that Josh Berry is going to drive full-time. We know Sam Mayer is going to drive full-time. 
So if they re-sign Justin Algar, Michael Annette, and Noel Gregson, that's five teams in the Xfinity Series next year for JR Motorsports, which is a possibility if all the sponsorship deals come through. Right. Now, what I think a lot of people have forgotten, Rick Hendrick is part owner of JR Motorsports. Mm-hmm. So since Hendrick is at his max of four teams in Cup, in order for JR Motorsports to go Cup, Rick Hendrick has to divest himself of his ownership percentage in JR Motorsports. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that's got to have to happen oh, there. Yeah, okay. But, you know, with Jeff Gordon coming in and, and overseeing the day-to-day right. operations and with Chad Canals doing what he's doing and all, it's right. going to be interesting to see how things develop there. Yep. And then, of course, Chevrolet has the, the engine departments from – Hendrick and RCR working closer together like Roush Yates and Toyota. I didn't mean to throw that at you, but I know you're very knowledgeable about stuff, and I figured we were kind of at our Wednesday afternoon roundtable, and I was, Deb, what do you think about this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you okay. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah was... But, uh, and you said JTG selling yeah, to uh, Harvick? You know, you know. Well, I don't know. You know, Harvick owned that race team, a race team once before, and now he's got, he and Delana have that business of more like being agents Mm -hmm. for athletic people. Mm -hmm. Having known the pitfalls of team ownership, they might choose to stay on as agents for various athletic entities. Yeah, and if Keelan takes a because Keelan's been racing too in go karts yeah. and stuff, so who knows? You Again, never know. Next generation coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, you got uh, Braxton and Keelan and sure. Yeah. Let's yep. see who. Uh, what's um, Boyer's son's name? Uh, Chase or Chase? Uh, yeah, I think it's Chase. Or something like yeah, he's yeah, racing yeah, too. He's so yeah, too. you you can already start uh, seeing how it's coming along. Boy, who feels old, huh? Yeah, you're getting old there, Phil. <laughs> I was, uh, was going to compliment you on your shirt too. It looks familiar. Yeah, that's the that's old an oldie and a goodie. One. Let me get what, what does that say that I'm I've had that for like. 30 years almost, Winston Cup scene. Yeah. It's not even the NASCAR logo. Uh, yeah, that would have been uh, probably 92, well, 90, no, 91, I, 92. I started 93, so they didn't well, get Well, no, any... you were shooting in 92 as yeah, a stringer. Yeah, I didn't get a polo in 92 as a stringer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then we needed to talk to the photo yeah, editor I mean, at that time. Yeah, who was that? Go ahead. Yeah, tell yeah. them who I replaced that you worked with that people might recognize. Cindy, Cindy Elliott. Cindy... Well, yeah, I always say Cindy Karam. Karam. Don't you, don't you yeah. know who Cindy Karam is? And they're like, no, I'm like, that's Chase's mother, Cindy Elliott, Mary yep. Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In about fact, that. she and I roomed together on the road. What was that like? It was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had some We had some good times together. Yeah. Has she dated yeah. anybody else before Bill? Yes. See, that's what happens, and I've seen that a lot when I was Let her elaborate. Go ahead. (laughs) Will Lynn. Billy Wilburn. Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. We had Billy Wilburn on the show. Did you? How's he doing? He's doing great. Good. He's got a mate over there at Junior Motorsports, you know. Oh, is that where he is now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's overseeing a bunch of stuff over there. Oh, great. Good for him. Had him on, and then the the next week or two after, I had Danny Earnhardt, uh, Junior's cousin. Right. So... That was a good show, too. And he wants to get into doing some of this podcast-type stuff. Mm-hmm. Or, or, yeah, you know, everybody's doing things. that now. Yeah. Pretty so much. I said, well, come on over. If, you're, if your cousin Junior's not letting you join in on his, <laughs> just come help me out, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did. Yeah, and that's when I got that uh, message from Junior during the show. And he said to ask him how, how many other people have offered him a job, and he hasn't taken it. Any cup teams. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, but I didn't see it till like a month later. So. Oh, wasn't blowing him off. I'm just saying I didn't do that on purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fell into your junk box. It did, yeah. So that's what happens sometimes. Uh, so, hey, if you're, if you're, what race are you going to next? Darlington. Darlington, okay. So you're going to Darlington. Where are you going, Phil? Milwaukee this weekend for an Milwaukee. ARCA race. Wisconsin. Okay, so I got this deal. It's Great RV Life, mm-hmm. which is one of our sponsors. It's my, <clears throat> my friend Sheila Duncan and, and Scott McCormick. And Scott works down at Ralph Yates, but he don't want everybody to know that. But anyway, that's... Uh, <laughs> we won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so they started this deal. I don't know why he's worried about it. It's not like it's a conflict of interest or mm. anything, you know. But anyway, they started... You, where you can rent an RV 
which is very cool. I mm-hmm. think and it fits right into the racing deal. So you can uh, give them a call. Actually, send them a message on Instagram or Facebook. Great with an eight G R eight R V life. It's on the screen now. And then you can, uh, we'll hook you right up. They'll take it and set it up at the racetrack for you. You can rent it and it saves you a lot of the expense of owning one, which, you know, can get well, very that's expensive. That's a great idea. Yeah. And especially because Charlotte Motor Speedway has reasonable prices. You can get it in, you know, inside the track for the weekend. You pull it in, you're there for Thursday to Sunday mm-hmm. or Monday and it's perfect. Yeah. The RV that I have now is, it's a travel trailer and it was the one that was Mike Helton's. Oh, really? Yep. It's a two bedroom. And I'll sell it to you, by the way. It's two bedroom. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it it's very long. I'm sure it is. But it's nice. I, mean, I was going to say, I'm sure if it was Mike Helton's, it's very nice. Yeah. yeah. 39 foot, correct? 39 foot, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it was out of Robert Yates' farm when he lived in Rhonda. Oh, really? Because he didn't have a house on it. It just had his uh, barn and uh-huh. stuff. And so he lived in it there. And then Nick Ramey ended up with it. Now I ended up with it. So. I see. And it has quite it. a history. It mm-hmm. does, yes. Mm-hmm. All I'm, in the racing so I'm thinking mm-hmm. about, I might just keep it and park it. It's outside my shop right now. Mm-hmm. And then I can just go out there and let's say I'm, I'm all dirty from working in my shop. I'm going to go in there and take my shower and I might accidentally just pass out on the bed in there with air conditioning on. Plenty of room. Mm-hmm. That's right. Other than that, but we also have Jersey Cape Yachts. Yeah, Jersey Cape Yachts. Uh, <laughs> that's our favorite Jersey Cape Yachts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, they got the 31 to 66 footer, and you can there are custom yachts built for you. Just you can go to Lake Norman with them, mm-hmm. right? And what else do they have going on though? Something well, they have a case. hurricane relief situation where you sign up and pay ahead of time to have your boat taken out of hurricane danger inland, stored, no problem. Where are they based? Uh, is it New Bern, New Jersey? Or uh, it's it's uh, in, yeah, it's New Jersey. It's in New Jersey. It wasn't New Bern. It's a <laughs> well, well, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have my, I got this one little scrap piece of paper here. I was writing stuff on and it was just to make sure I mentioned a couple other things, but anyway, <clears throat> yeah. Lower Cape, Lower Cape, New Jersey. Yes. It just pops in my head. Oh, when I quit okay. thinking about it, I got distracted mm-hmm. with this. I'm like, there it is. So anyway, gotcha. Tracy, you got any questions? Not yet. No, no questions. questions. Okay. I do. I do. Um, all right. I've got plenty <laughs> got her against the wall right now. Oh, yes. Um, mm. All of our scene times, what was one of your favorite moments covering during all your years at scene? Oh, wow. If you can pick a race or a, an event, I can think of a couple that you and I experienced that were really neat. Okay. You tell me what yours are, and we'll see if we... I would say one of the neatest was the 50th anniversary in Hollywood at the NASCAR. Oh yeah, when we had, we had ver- the limo to go yeah, in. And yeah, and there was only I mean there was only George Tiedemann and myself and I believe one other photographer that were allowed in. Morgan Shepherd was skating on stage. Everybody was in tuxes. Mm-hmm. It was it was quite a moment. I mean it with was. a red carpet. Yeah. In Hollywood. And yeah. it was it was just a neat thing. Yeah. Um Earnhardt's win at the Daytona. Daytona 500. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the first indie brickyard. Oh yeah, and, definitely. And only that brickyard race <laughs> well and i was there for the test too and I that was very okay. special was yeah. was being there for the test the the yeah. quote unquote tire test well the enormity I, I imagine was quite overwhelming to that big of a place empty and just you know oh yeah and of course Earnhardt was there riding a bicycle backwards by sitting on its handlebars Oh, yeah. And it was funny because I had never been to Indianapolis Motor Speedway before. And we went from Michigan to Indy for the the test. And everybody who had ever covered the Indy 500 kept telling me since I had never been there, do whatever the yellow shirts tell you. Don't buck the yellow shirts. Just say yes and go on. Well, I pulled into the the racetrack the first day, and this large, tall man wearing a yellow shirt comes up to me, and he said, do you know where you're going? Hmm. I looked up, and I said, no, sir, I've never been here before. And he just broke into the biggest smile, and he said, oh, you're one of the good guys. (laughs) (laughs) Uh And um, 
So that test was really cool. Now, Alan Kawicki was very angry that he was not invited to that test. And he immediately started working on chassis setups and, and trying to figure out on chassis and, and how to, he was going to run mm. the brickyard. Yeah. Because he was angry that he didn't get invited to the test. But oh. the final day, I mean, everybody was just going ballistic and the fans and the media coverage of it. And, of course, the drivers were over there signing autographs just as hard as they could sign them. And they were getting, they were at the fence. And Bill France Jr. looked at Dick Beatty, who was the Winston Cup garage director at that time. And Bill France Jr. pointed to his hat, pointed to Dick Beatty's hat, and then pointed to the fans on the other side of the fence. Mm. And... Dick looked at me, and he said, Bill wants to throw the hat, the Winston Cup Series hat, to the fans. Hmm. He said, here, you throw it. And he took his cap off and gave it to me and let me throw it. Oh, that's cool. So that was neat. But, you know, I had so many special times to just think. I mean, it was so neat. Steve Wade knew that I had always been a Richard Petty fan growing up and during my childhood and all. And, of course, with my dad being a machinist, he had a lot of respect for Lee Petty because of the way Lee handled his equipment and that he was not a go or blow driver. You know, he mm-hmm. knew how to take care of his equipment. And so when 1992 came along, and that was Richard Petty's final year, Steve Wade assigned me to cover richard that entire year so i spent a lot of time with the petty family in 1992 yeah and uh in fact we spent so much time together that richard started treating me like one of his daughters Mm -hmm. and if he didn't like something about my car he told me (laughs) like your tail lock's out get it fixed (laughs) yes sir (laughs) so that was a a wonderful time and i will have to say now that kyle petty is my brother always wanted. I think of him as the brother I always wanted, but never had. Yeah, you know. I'm telling you, to quit being so dang busy and come on the show. <laughs> I've been trying to get him on here for a couple of years now. Yeah, man. You know how he is, <laughs> and, and then he goes and starts another show. I'm I like, know. Do you not have know. enough to do already? Yeah, with like with you. two baby boys. Yeah, well, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, wow. he, he, you know, well, <laughs> yeah, Morgan's, uh, yeah. So, oh man, I don't know how he keeps up, but I guess this, it is kind of a lot like me. I stay busy all the yes. time. So, uh, be a workaholic like me. Yeah. Yeah. That, David has 50 million projects all oh, the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Phil will attest to me being a workaholic. Yeah, you both are equal. David is retired, but he's busier than that. It, yeah. He's unbelievable, the stuff he does. So, mm-hmm. is this a workaholic? If, all right, Saturday morning, I got up at, I actually slept till almost seven o'clock for routines. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I'm used to getting up at five or six, so I get up, I'm on a computer three hours, I go and mow for 12 hours, I come home, and then I'm on a computer till midnight, so three more hours. Mm-hmm. Is that and then I got up the next morning and I'm at it again about eight hours Sunday. Well, and, I spent Saturday mowing the yard, and I have to admit that kind of wears me out. Yeah, the heat too, especially. David was wore out, yeah, yeah. Mm. I was Sunday, that's why I did computer stuff and did yeah. some video, and yeah. But see, my house is built on the property of the old Concord Speedway. Oh. that was operated from the 60s up until the Furs shut that track down and built the one on 601 South, which unfortunately now has shut down. Yeah. So it's amazing what all comes up in my field, and it takes a little bit longer to mow because of the the potholes that have come up and the concrete that's come up. And hmm. the people I bought the house from, told me that the first couple of years they lived there that every time there was a really hard rain a lot of beer cans and beer bottles wound oh, up in the yard I, bet so. I was going to yeah. say do you put your ear to the ground and still hear the rumbling, the rumbling. well yeah. i will say that if i'm mowing on a saturday afternoon instead of a saturday morning if i'm mowing on a saturday afternoon sometimes i'll turn the lawn tractor off when i'm in the backfield and i'll sit there and prop my feet up on it and just imagine and hear the loudspeaker and the cars <laughs> and and everything oh, yeah. and the fans because the person who lives to my left, there's like a bank behind his house and that's where the grandstands were. Part of my house sits mm. on the old first turn. And Bill Connell told me 
for those of you who don't remember Bill Cannell, he was the public Bill address Cannell. announcer yeah, at Charlotte. Charlotte, and he always had a radio show in Daytona during mm-hmm. Speed Weeks. Mm-hmm. And Bill told me that that track was actually where he began his announcing career wow. when he came back from Vietnam and was discharged from the military. And he also told me that was the dirt track that's used in the opening scenes of the movie Last American Hero. Oh, how about that? Very so, cool. That's cool. Yeah. That does is his, great. Does Bill Cannell's son announce now? Did I, is it? I don't know. For some reason, I want to say he's announcing all somewhere, too. But So we need to come out there and visit your property. How about that? Yeah, and what's really cool yeah. is if you go to the houses across the street from me and stand and look down, you can see the form of the old backstretch mm-hmm. because the street that comes in front of my house comes right through what was the infield. Okay. So uh, a junior show is called, is it Lost Speedways or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, what can, what can my uh, show be peacock. called? Peacock. What can our show be called? Well, Racing Roots with David Ham. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the Speedways. Yeah, we're going to go, our first Speedway is going to be on Deb's property. I would love that. <laughs> I'd love to, I would love to do Just that. Just make sure that I can get permission <laughs> yeah. from all the neighbors. Say, can we come uh, on your property? Uh, we we're going to be anything. digging here. We'll do it. At, yeah, we'll do it overnight. Everybody's in bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, you might run into the deer yeah. then. But we do okay. have a hawk that showed up about a... Yeah. A week and a half after we lost Earnhardt. And mm-hmm. Bill Cannell told me that was the track where Earnhardt drove his first ever race. Wow, that's very cool. So I have named the Hawk Earnhardt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting when he shows up. And sometimes he'll come and, like before the leaves came on the trees, he would come and sit in my tree beside the driveway. And I've even seen him sitting on the uh, light post beside the driveway. How about that? So yep, it's I mean, really cool. You just never know. No. You'll know if it's a real Earnhardt spirit if he on your car there or something. We got a commercial break coming up. So. <laughs> oh, what's yeah, interesting is go, making it, watching him dive bomb into the field after oh, dinner. Oh yeah, sure, uh-huh. sure. <laughs> Actually, it's time for commercial, but not just <laughs> well, because of that. Well, I segued a little, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm still trying to think of a name, but we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll be back. We got Deb Williams here on racing roots with ham hope you're enjoying this and if y'all have any questions go to uh, my youtube page d ham i am that's d h as in ham and my m two m's i a m kind of like sam i am but with two m's anyway so we'll be right back on racing roots with ham it's the 85th annual iredell county agricultural fair friday september Buy today, go to work tomorrow. Don't wait on that thing to come in. Put it to work making you money. Randy Marion Ford Lincoln, right off I-77, exit 49B. Home of the spinning cars, because that is where the deals are. All right, we're back on Racing Roots with Ham on 550 AM and 92.9 FM. And D Ham I Am on YouTube. And that, that's just the channel name I came up with. It's not that the channel is about me, but some people use their name. A lot of people use their name mm-hmm. as their channel. That's but, true. You know, I just thought, well, that's different. And yeah. so I would just like to be different. Cool. And so about, I don't know, five years ago. But I didn't get back into this about two years, no, three years ago. 
Oh, it's the third anniversary of me doing this show. Or it's actually, Is me it? and Tracy started mm -hmm. and in my living room. In our living room. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Third. Last week was the third there anniversary. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. how neat is that? And we, and pretty much been doing it every Monday since. We've only taken like two or three off. Yeah. So it's just been hammered down the whole time. We've even and, done it on vacation. Well, now, did you do mm -hmm. radio before you got into racing? No. Really? I never thought I would be able to do that. And I MC like on the main stage here last Friday um, in front of the, you know, whoever comes cool. out. So that kind of stuff. I never thought I would. Cause I've always been extremely shy as a kid, but it's like they say, you know, face your fears and uh, it just makes you, I guess, I don't, it's a challenge for me. Yeah. Just like as a, as a Jack man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I played high school baseball and football. I didn't start football till 11th grade or 10th grade. I'm sorry. And then I just decided I wanted to be a Jack man before I even got into NASCAR. You know, it's just, I've just kind of always been that way. I want to go after the things that almost seem impossible. Mm -hmm. And then once I reach them, I'm like, okay, What's next? Tracy makes him the man he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, all right, speaking of her, I, I have known her since uh, we were in kindergarten, first grade. Uh, Elementary school. Yeah. Wow. On the playground. Down How in about Charlotte. that? And That's I was, neat. Yeah, down in Charlotte. And I was going to ask her, do you remember riding down, I think it may be Toddville Road. It's off a, a Little Rock, and it's near Little Rock, and Tuxedee. Okay. There was a guy, that, I say a guy, there was a house down there always had these Winston Cup vehicles lined up. Was that Humpy's house? No. No, it wasn't Humpy's house. So you know where I'm talking about. Everybody kind of knew it was. I don't know. Yes. You know, I'm over, and it was where? Over a certain age. Down in Charlotte, off of Little Rock Road. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Dick Beatty. Dick Beatty or Dick Brooks? Now, Dick Beatty lived. Dick Brooks. You would take the... Uh, Let's see, I got mine playing This now. was back in the 70s. Yeah, no. That would have been before I moved here. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was back in the 70s when we were in school. Yeah. But the question did come through, Dave. You want me to go ahead and ask yeah. it? Yeah, go for it. So Rachel asked, what speedway does Deb miss the most that was once part of the Cup Series? North Wilkesboro. I knew that. I put my you hand up. I was like, Wilkesboro, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that's because... There was a connection there at North Wilkesboro of the way racing was with my childhood. And the first race that I covered for United Press International by myself, because Jerry Mitchell, who was the UPI Charlotte Bureau Manager, trained me on how to cover a race for the wire service. And the state editor tried let me do north wilkesboro by myself before charlotte and rockingham and all and it was kind of a momentous of time you might say in my career and in my life and my parents drove from canton to north wilkesboro that for that race and then we picnicked there in the field like we did when I was a child Good. so that was neat and then uh, you know with Flossie and Junior always had their their breakfast there on Saturdays mm -hmm. and of course Terry Labonte got on my case for eating so much at one of <laughs> Flossie's breakfasts but it's good. Uh, it was yeah. so good, yeah. yeah. And then when they reopened Wilkesboro for a brief time, and I would go up there, I'd stay with Flossie. Mm -hmm. And that was neat. But, yeah, I miss North Wilkesboro. And it was interesting because North Wilkesboro was actually the first press box that actually had a restroom for women. Oh. At Darlington and Rockingham, there was one restroom in the press box and everybody used it mm -hmm. and then at martinsville you had to go outside to where the fans were and all if you wanted to use the restroom but yeah north wilkesboro has a lot of a lot of special memories and uh, funny stuff like before i started covering a race there mike mulhern was the reporter for the winston-salem journal and he had written something in the paper on Sunday morning that the fans didn't like. And when he came down the steps out of the press box, they were waiting for him at the bottom of the press <laughs> box. And they chased him down through the grandstands, through the flag stand 
opening in the fence and across the track after the race this was after the race and junior johnson saw what was happening and junior grabbed mulhern and threw him in a car and told the driver to get him out of there and so hank schoolfield and don wilson who ran the press operation there boxed up mulhern's this was before computers boxed up his typewriter and everything and shipped it back to the winston-salem paper how about that for him i wonder if they wow. wonder if mike hill was the driver <laughs> he jokes about <laughs> i don't that know yeah drivers yeah sometimes. that's true that's true <laughs> but that was yeah. north wilkesboro was also where a fan tried to cut off kyle petty's ponytail one time oh. wow. actually reached in the window of the car as wow. he was sitting in line to go out the back okay back exit from the track i had not heard that do you do you think wilkesboro will be revived I, I I always thought it'd be great if Dale Jr. bought it. Mm, just stay tuned. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I can't say. The I'm not. Infamous fence climber well, says he's heard that they're cleaning it up. Yeah, that is correct. They yeah. are cleaning it up. Well, yeah. they allocated what ten million dollars. Well, they hadn't got that money yet. No, but they but know, allegedly. Plan. <laughs> it's it's been allocated yeah. there. They just yeah. have to go through the paperwork and all. But mm -hmm. it is being cleaned up, and the firefighter or the volunteer firefighters and all in in wilkes county actually ha go out and have a cutting of of trees and wood and all for people that they stack it up and season and everything for the people that need wood in the winter mm -hmm. that can't afford it and so they're cut the trees they cut this month all right wilkesboro that's brilliant i like mm -hmm. that yeah very good so I, i've been saying this for a while and i just thought about it they you know they went and put dirt on bristol mm -hmm. why didn't they just put that dirt on Wilkes wilkesboro well you got to look at the financial there. situation yeah. and that you know if you had it dirt there's you can't really have concerts there because people don't want to bring their equipment in there and yeah. get all the, the dust and everything. So <laughs> yeah. you've got to look at it and decide which way would be the best financial way to go. Yeah, just make it a big venue so it's not just about the yeah. races. Yeah, that's what you got to look at. But there's yeah. so much infrastructure that's got to be rebuilt and, and mm -hmm. everything because it's um, it was really to go back to the, when we were racing at Wilkesboro, the women – who were married to people that were involved in the track would cook the lunch down below the press box and then carry the food up to the press box. And we, it was a typical mountain Sunday lunch or dinner that we would have. We would have fried chicken, yeah. ham, deviled eggs, uh, pound cake, green beans. What we call Home, home cooking. cooking. Yeah, we had right. home cooking, yeah. Yeah, but no casseroles. No casseroles, no. <laughs> and unfortunately, the, we lost uh, a woman that really took good care of us with her food at Atlanta and Rockingham and Charlotte and all, Jane Hogan. Jane, yeah. Yeah, Jane oh, Hogan passed was, away earlier this year. Oh, did she? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, she sure Bless did. Bless her heart. She was an incredible. She would put a feast together for the media that you... You wouldn't find it this day and age anywhere. Oh, I know. And I'll never forget one time David Chobat, mm -hmm. Brian's older brother, David, complained about the lunch. And she said, you'll never eat another lunch because she took care of Rockingham and a couple other ones. Too, Rockingham, you know? Atlanta, Charlotte. Yep. <laughs> and I can't remember if she did. She might have done Darlington, but I'm not it sure. Could be. Now, do you remember the meals that were homemade by the, the families up in Poconos in the 90s and 80s? They bring in all that homemade pasta in Pocono, the Mattiolis. Yeah, I, you know, it was interesting. I saw a picture the other week of the first pasta dinner that they did in the media center, and there was Dr. Rose and Michelle and Louie mm -hmm. at the, the oh. pasta, the pasta what dinner. What year was that? I don't remember. Because I go got one. I, I went for quite a few years. They tuned it down to just Friday afternoons. but Yeah, and I missed it this time. Of course, it was either Lou, I think it was Michelle told me the pasta was terrible this year. I don't know who mm. cooked it, but she. I said, well, I missed the pasta, but the cannoli was good. Mm. <laughs> the cannoli. Hey, so it was Dick Beatty we were talking about earlier, lived down there in Charlotte. Okay. I, just, for, I was All getting right. a little bit of a mind blank, so I got that squared away. I and had to look and up, I'd sure. like to point out, Dickie Dennis had pointed out that it's Cash Boyer. 
Oh, cash. Boy, your oh, okay, great. Cash. Yeah, That's cash. Yeah. I forgot. Got That's you covered, good. Dickie. Yeah. Thank thanks. you, Dickie. Yeah, there is another question that came in. Okay. Okay, so Sam Sharp says, "Love you, Deb." Oh, hey, Knowing Sam. Knowing how the '93 season was so magical in so many ways for all of us, but had tragedies as well. How did the deaths of Davy and Alan affect you, and did they affect you differently? Wow. <laughs> Sam, yeah, they definitely affected me. Tough year. Uh, it was a tough year. Do we have to take a break? No, we don't. Oh, we're I good. thought you were. No, we're good to the oh. end. No, I was oh, just. Okay. Ta- I had in my. Head, I was moving it. So what I'm trying to do is keep this mic from covering Phil up because I've got this camera on Phil today because that one's whatever. I'm gonna have to work on it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's on the fridge. <laughs> Ninety three so was a a tough season. That was the first year that I was editor of Scene, and I would go in to work at. By eight by eight thirty, eight or eight thirty in the mornings, and sometimes not leave until midnight, and be back because we were so short staffed, and we were trying to rebuild, and and then the night that we lost Alan, uh, David Green was our managing editor at the time, and David and I had gone over to Johnson City, and of course I was very familiar with the area because I had graduated from East Tennessee State University. And we walked in to the hotel because at that time, you know, the drivers didn't have motorhomes and we all stayed at the same hotels. And Alan always stayed at the hotel where we stayed. And as soon as we walked in, we were checking in and they said something about the Hooters plane going down. And I I just was stunned. And we immediately, I said, let's go to the airport and so we immediately hopped back in our vehicle and went to the airport and got there. And Alan's friends that he was going to meet for dinner was there with a blind date. And then um, Paul Andrews was there, uh, Cal Lawson. Danny Glad. Danny Glad was there. And um, no, I remember no, I had sitting, I got a... Cal Lawson's now wife, then girlfriend, thanked me later for being there to hold Cal as he cried. And we just all could not believe it. And I still feel the cold snow blowing that day when Peter Jellin took the last lap. Mm. Yeah, Peter Jellin. I was going to mention him. He come in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, of course, um, Doyle Ford was the flagman. And um, I remember standing up there. That's when they had the crossover. And you still went in with a box truck and your hauler stayed outside. And I was standing at the the gate with Ernie and Kim Irvin. And it was blowing snow and it was so cold. And um, so that was a very emotional time. And it's really strange how, you know, they turned it over to me because I had been a general news reporter with the wire service and all. And, of course, Griggs Publishing had taken Allen under its wing when Allen moved to North Carolina. Rob Griggs and Steve Wade were always picking on him and inviting him to our functions and everything. So we were around Allen a great deal. And Steve had told me to handle everything about the crash and all because of my general news background. And it's strange because your mind just takes... I guess your subconscious, whatever, you take over and you go into work mode and you don't really think about what's just happened until it's over with. And, you know, Dick Trickle was so good to me when we went to Wisconsin for Alan's funeral. Uh, Dick Trickle, Butch Mock, Jeff Bodine and his wife, we were all on the same commercial plane going up there for the service. And so Dick Trickle and Butch Mock kind of took over and made sure I was in. Butch had thought a lot of Alan and had, had, Alan was the one that, that gave Butch the feeling that he could still compete against these bigger teams. And so Dick Trickle came over to me after the service, and he said, are you going to, the, to lunch? And I said, no, I've got to catch a flight back. 
and Dick Trickle did not want me flying commercial back by myself. And he went to Jane Gossage, who had arranged for the people to be on the private planes that Felix Sabatis and Rick Hendrick flew people up there on. Mm -hmm. And some of the people were staying, and Jane had a seat available on one of the Hendrick planes coming back from Alan's funeral. And so Dick Trickle watched after me just as if I was his daughter. And he got me on the same Hendrick plane coming back with him and Butch Mock coming back from Alan's funeral. And then when they had the service here in Charlotte, Beth Tushak was the motorsports rider for USA Today at the time. And Beth rode the train, the Amtrak train from DC down to Concord in order to go to Alan's service. She came in and, and spent the night with me after she got off the, the train. But, um, you know, that was a, a very sadness to me to, to know how hard he had worked and how he had gone, everything he had gone through. And he was the most intelligent man that I had ever met up until that time. And I admired his uh, so intellectual, so intelligent. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also fun to pick on because of it. Mm -hmm. His favorite TV show was ALF, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that was very emotional. And uh, you re we really, it, but it was the same for all the motorsports community, not just me, but the entire motorsports community because of the respect that everyone had for him and what he had accomplished. And then when we lost Davey, everybody was in disbelief. And of course, we lost Davey on my birthday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Davey died on my birthday. And we had been flying back from New Hampshire that Monday. And we walk into the office, the scene office that Monday night and found out that Davy's helicopter had gone down. And so for many years after that, Liz Allison would always, she would be the first call that I would get on my birthday. And Liz Allison said, let's don't remember it as the day Davy died. Let's remember it as your birthday. So. Well, that's sweet. I, I was thinking that's what, one thing you'd always remember though. When it's my birthday. Well, yeah. You remember yeah. that too as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, so Davey always picked on me. He found out that I was ticklish and he would, <laughs> he loved to come up behind me and gooch me. Yeah. And he would, you know, you see the cartoons where Snoopy is walking around loose, looking at Lucy and Charlie Brown before he goes running or maybe not Lucy, but Linus with <laughs> Linus's blanket. And then he goes running and grabs Linus's blanket and yeah. flips him. Well, Davey would look, would stalk me around through the garage like Snoopy. You'd look over and you'd see him and there'd be that twinkle in that eye and that laughter. And after he had his bad crash in the 1992 All-Star Race, it was funny because we had the same chiropractor. And the chiropractor that Davey used was also Harry Hyde's and I think Jeff Bodine's and mine. And the chiropractor was getting Davy in at that after his all-star crash. He would get Davy in at eight o'clock in the morning and work on him till eight thirty and get him out before his other patients started coming in. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to talk to Davy in the transporter, I guess Thursday of Charlotte Race Week, six hundred week, and I walked up in the front of the transporter and <laughs> Davy lays down and says, Okay, Doc what's going to be the questions that you're going to give me today? <laughs> so, you know, that, um, that was a uh, one hot night. Yep. I was there yep. on the top back stretch, top row, full moon mm -hmm. and sparks flying, parts mm -hmm. flying up in the air. Yeah. And Kyle getting into that big wreck. Yeah. And of course, as always, I had the Earnhardt sidebar assigned to me, but, um, <laughs> you know, those, they hurt, and they hurt differently. The closest that I ever came to walking away from the sport was when we lost Adam Petty because I was at Richard and Linda's the day that Kyle broke, 
Patty and Adam home from the hospital when Adam was born. Mm. So I had been around him all his growing up days. And then I thought, well, you know, Adam wouldn't want me to walk away from it. But after Ryan Newman's wreck, I told myself that night when I was at Daytona and after working with Ryan at Penske and writing his book, Mm -hmm. And I stood in that garage and, and the silence. You know, a racetrack is the only place where silence is not golden. Mm-hmm. No. And I told myself that night that if Ryan did not make it, I was walking away. Yeah. I'd had enough. Yeah. that, would, that I was amazed that yeah. he, he made it, you know. That he walked away. He walked away, yeah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. A few days later. Just to see him in that picture holding his two little girls' hands from oh. the back, walking oh, away with... Yeah with uh, socks on his feet was magic. It was. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah, because, I, I mean, when I, I had left the Speedway, right with it's the wrecks left, I had my motor home headed out of town. I was getting calls, and I'd heard it on the radio, and it just made me numb until I could feel assured he was okay. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that, what that night reminded me of, the silence in the garage and the silence in the media center and all, Earnhardt. was the night we lost Earnhardt. Yep, yep. It was history repeated all over again. And I never will forget that night we lost Earnhardt. Mike Helton walked in, and he walked up to the front of the old media center. It wasn't the current one. Benny Kahn. Yeah, the Benny Kahn. And he just looked at everybody, and all he said was, we've lost Earnhardt. Hmm. And uh, to me, that was uh, repeated all over again, and uh, the silence and the way everybody was and all after Ryan's wreck. Where, where were you when, when you heard about Earnhardt's death? I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the press box calling the race for our photographers that day. And I remember Phil was on pit road. Bambi Matilla was in the fourth turn. Brian Hallman was on the back stretch. I don't remember who was in turn one. And Maybe Jay Jagler. Who? Probably Jay Jagler. Okay. And I remember they were coming down to the white flag, and I remember calling on the radio and saying, heads up, heads up. Of course, Tony Stewart had already wrecked, you know. He had mm-hmm. gone airborne that day on the back stretch. And I remember calling on the radio and saying, white flag lap, heads up, heads up, last lap, there's going to be a wreck. And, you know, because you watch them as much as we do, and you know how everybody races. You know everybody's mm-hmm. style. And... um So, after calling a race, then I would always go back across the track to the infield media center to write. And the spotters, of course, were allowed through the gate. And the spotters would help me get through. Uh, They've actually gotten and pulled me through fans to get me through the gate. And I got down there with the spotters, and we were waiting for them to open the gate. And I looked over at Earnhardt Spotter, Danny Culler. And Danny looked at me and our eyes met and he just kind of shrugged his shoulders like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went on across. And when I saw Tony Fur Sr. crying. Yuri. Tony Yuri, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Tony. Mm -hmm. When I saw Tony Yuri Sr. crying, I knew. Mm -hmm. And I took Bambi in the women's restroom, and she knew as soon as I took her into the women's restroom to tell her what had happened, because unfortunately, Bambi was at New Hampshire in the turn when we lost Adam Petty. She was at New Hampshire in the turn when we lost Kenny Irwin Jr. And she told me, she said, I knew it as soon as I saw it and saw the expression on Ken Schrader's face when he looked, when he turned around after looking in the car. She said, I've seen that hit too many times. So. Yeah, it was like an immediate, just turned around like you didn't want to see anymore pretty, yeah. pretty much, yeah. Yeah, the reporter sitting across from me would would wipe tears and write a while and write a while and then wipe mm. tears. Yeah. Yeah, and, and all I saw, I mean, I was there the day before, but I was uh, whatever, Bush race. And what I was watching, you know, was, of course, Barry Walter up on TV. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, I hope he's okay. Is he okay? You know, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then uh, found out a little bit later that he had passed away. And yeah. then I remember just uh, just uh, crying. I mean, you know, it was an upsetting moment for – it's it's kind of like that in NASCAR, and I know you know this because you're – it's kind of like you're a big family. 
Oh yeah, so anytime exactly. Anytime you lose someone, it it's, uh, it's pulls on your heartstrings. Um, and another one we lost this week was uh, Libby Gant. I don't know if you remember Libby Gant from. She was uh, with uh, Robert Yates forever. She was like, yeah, the, I remember Libby. Yeah, and now she's been working with the with the forty three car. I guess she's still over there where she was. Um, but yeah, she just passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, so I think it was. Uh, it might have even been yesterday. I actually saw the obituary for the first mm. time. So yeah. Where did you see the obituary? On Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know it's real. Mm-hmm. No, I'm kidding. It's uh, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's where I saw it on the on the Facebooks and. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, so favorite track that you've ever been to, Deb? <laughs> it's it's easier for me to tell you which one's my least favorite. Um, well, let's do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, gee. Well, it's like I always say when people say who's your favorite driver, and I always say which one's going to make the best story for that day. Oh yeah. You know, right? So, favorite track. Mm. Charlotte has a lot of memories for me. First time I ever saw Charlotte Motor Speedway, I was 13 years old, and I fell in love with the area and promised myself that one day I would live in this area and work in stock car racing. Mm-hmm. So, I, I've thought there was. There's been a lot of special times there with my parents and. And, uh, you know, races covered and everything. It's just had a large, large part in my life. But uh, Bristol, that was the first track that I got to go, that Daddy tried me at to see how I would do out of the Asheville area. And he tried me at Bristol when I was 10 with Mother. Mother went with us to that. And, of course, you know, where I grew up, Asheville was the only, the closest place I mean, Bristol was two hours, Charlotte was three hours, Rockingham was four hours. We went to Daytona for the 4th of July race. The year I turned 13, Daddy decided I was old enough to go to the super speedways. But that's the only vacation that my family ever took my entire life, and they ever took, was when we went to Daytona for the Firecracker 400 on July 4th, 1967. Wow, how about that? Yeah. Mm-hmm, very cool. So, right. but my favorite track, that would be hard. Yeah. What about the least? Least. Come on. I never particularly cared going for California Speedway. I could not agree more. Yeah. <laughs> now, they're supposed to reconfigure that to a quarter mile? Yeah, a short track. Uh. Yeah, and I think what a lot of people have missed is the reason they had the Daytona Road Course race this year was as a substitute for the California Speedway because of COVID and all. They couldn't go back there and race. Yeah. And I don't know when it's going to be ready, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Daytona Road Course doesn't disappear once California, they can go back to Southern California again. What did you think of the Indy Road Course race? Well, I'll have to admit <laughs> that... I was engaged on a different project that weekend, and I didn't get to see that much of the Indy races. But uh, when I turned the cup race on, they were under a red flag, and I got to see part of the Xfinity race. But honestly, I didn't see enough of it to be able to comment on it. My only thought is that they sh- I don't understand why they made the rumple strips out of metal. <laughs> I don't either. They were launching cars. It's like, yeah, but I mean, when you look at, at, they know they run over them. I mean, look at Sonoma. Mm Yeah. And look at the fantastic photos that you got with them going up, hitting the speed pumps. Yeah, yeah, going up in the first turn. That's a really hard, hard rubber, if anything. Yeah, and my question that came to my mind was, what do they have over here for the roval, for those Mm. speed bumps? And if they're not metal, what are they? And why didn't they use that? For the yeah. the indie road course, so that's my main question. But having worked for Roger Penske and known how he does things, I guarantee you he had his people in there that night after that race, and had them back in a meeting on Monday. Yeah, he was mm-hmm. on the ground there. I saw him there Saturday and Sunday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's well, one he does on the track. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he. Yeah. You know, not always do you see the owner. You know, <laughs> you used to true. see Tony George just at 
pre-race and that was it mm-hmm. yeah when at california i know mm-hmm. that one of the things that i was impressed at how nice the track was that it had paid parking all the way around outside and all oh that. yeah oh yeah <laughs> We've done that at martinsville would have been nice but uh well i don't know i miss the duck pond at martinsville yes and seeing the people that were silly enough just park on the edge and watch their cars slide down oh yeah <laughs> didn't get out and rain and, well i miss the yeah. azaleas in the first turn yeah, that was always yeah. so beautiful when the azaleas were in bloom in the first turn and they let the photographer stand there and they let us cross during cautions yeah. oh yeah i forgot about that yeah you could caution. run across the track during a caution flag yeah that's how i knew the race was over when they were calling it. earnhardt would be standing over there ready to cross the track and i'm like all right well we're still got the pit box out here and he's over there with his leather jacket on and his jeans ready to go and his boots mm-hmm. ready to go across the track so we're like well i guess we'll start packing up <laughs> he's already called a race you know tracy was been to martinsville mm-hmm. with her dad her dad mm. worked in nascar oh really what'd your dad do he was on the pit crew with harry gant really mm-hmm. what's his name ken thompson okay mm-hmm. you know i saw harry a f- couple three weeks ago at johnny bruce's visita- visitation mm-hmm. harry looks younger now than he did when he stopped racing mm-hmm. wow yeah. I remember seeing him in Taylorsville at a concert, mm-hmm. and of course I ambushed him. Not really, but <laughs> okay. yeah. so, I walked in there, and he and Peggy were the first two people I saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, David pointed him out. I said, oh, Harry's here. Let's go talk to him. <laughs> yeah. Anytime so, somebody yeah. sees her, they're kind of like, yeah, I can see that. Like, and and uh, Robert Yates actually remembered uh, her mom. He okay. actually remembered yeah. her mom. So. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's and, good. Uh, That's good. Yeah. So we got three more minutes. And, and so um, anyway, that was, uh, and he told, he said, what did Robert Yates say to you? He said, I don't know if I should repeat this or not, but he said he remembered my mom because she got mad because they had a dancer at a party. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, that happens. <laughs> yeah, that'd be like the uh, belly dancer they brought into the, the Darlene Patterson brought into the cafeteria, the old cafeteria at Charlotte for Bill Elliott's birthday. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that did not go over very well when the AP photos appeared in the Gainesville paper. Exactly. Uh, no. How about that? What did Cindy think of that? <laughs> uh, Cindy, that was long before Cindy. That's when Bill was married to Martha. Oh, okay. That was uh, the early 1980s. Oh, that was talk like this, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yeah, I can I can see that. But uh, since we're on the topic of Robert Yates, you remember James Luter? That uh, was yes, the yes. machinist in, at Yates? Yep, sure do. One Thanksgiving weekend, they were working over at Robert Yates Racing. It was when they were at the old shop in North Charlotte. And... Um, I had talked to Luter and, and Robert, and since they were working, Robert told me that I could bring my dad over there for Dad to meet Luter. And cool. so I took Dad over there on a, that Friday after Thanksgiving, and he got to go in and see the shop. And he and Luter had a great conversation, a machine, yeah. a machinist conversation. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, speaking of your dad, what did he think of your career choice? Was he? He actually wanted me proud. to be a fighter pilot and an astronaut. Um, (laughs) He was in the Army Air Corps during World War II. Gotcha. But, no, he was very proud. Of course. Very happy. Mm -hmm. Um, He and Mother both were. And um, he he was always concerned about me working as hard as I did because he always felt that his father, who died of a massive stroke at 48 or 49, he always felt his father was a workaholic and worked himself to death so he was always concerned that i would do that mm-hmm. but he was very very happy and very proud and very supportive and actually when i first started covering working for the waynesville paper i was still in high school oh and i was covering high school football and basketball and i can remember one night we had pisgah was playing a junior varsity game over at Bavard, and so I did my homework while Mother drove me to Bavard. Mm-hmm. I covered the game, came home, wrote the story, and then after Mother dropped me off at school, she took my story up to the newspaper office Aww. because Friday was deadline day. But, 
you know, they were very happy and very proud and very excited and enjoyed it. And in fact, they were, the only thing Daddy really ever said was when I was traveling 27 to 30 weeks a year right. there towards the late 1990s, early 2000s. Daddy told me he wished I would quit traveling to so many of the races. And mm-hmm. I said, why? And he said, because as much as you're flying, he said, the odds are going to catch up to you. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, yeah, they were very happy. And they were very much a part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Linda Petty invited them down to the house one Thanksgiving and took them on a tour of the house and all. And then when the, the Shawls owned scene after they acquired it from Griggs, there was one Charlotte race that Mother and Daddy were coming down, and Whitney Shaw said, well, you know, since you've got to work, we'll take care of your parents. And they sent the limo to pick up Mother and Daddy Aww. and take them to the track and take them to the suite and then the limo to take them back so that I didn't have to worry about Aww, them. That so was nice. Uh, after Daddy died and I became my mom's primary caregiver, mm-hmm. It was interesting. We'd be sitting there, and I'd have the race on, and Mother would say, "There's that's where Debbie is. Debbie's at that race. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, no, Mama, I'm, I'm right here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I took her to Stocks for Tots with me the last Christmas before she passed, and she sat beside me while we were at Stocks for Tots, and she looked over at Bobby Alice, and she said, I know you. Yeah. Now, Mom was 96 at this wow. time. Wow. And, um Ned Jarrett stopped by to talk to her, and Butch Mock and Santa Claus spent time with her and all, and she really enjoyed that night. So, you know, they were very much a part of it as well. Absolutely. I, I would say that I could see you being the astronaut for sure. No, I, the now, fighter pilot, not the I'm astronaut. Just saying. Well, <laughs> my, my one concern about your dad worrying about you flying to races is that he wanted to put you in a capsule and Put you in space. <laughs> I was gonna say, are, you, are you calling her a space cadet? You know, before, yeah. no, before, no. before we had the shuttle blow up, you know, there was supposed yeah. to have been a journalist on the next shuttle yeah. flight. Yeah. Oh. And Daddy was wanting me to apply for that. Oh. And I said, no, Daddy. Mm. He said, well, I would love to go. I said, fine. Well, you you want to go? You go. I'm not going. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, he would have loved for me to. He wanted to be a fighter pilot so bad in yeah. the army air corps and then he mm. ended up they sent him to twin engine bomber school and and he washed mm. out but he wanted he would love to if i'd been a fighter pilot well i remember rick houston hated to fly remember oh gosh that? and i would about, and you used to aggravate him yeah no end. i would send him a link to a, to a website that was called am i going down.com <laughs> and you would put <laughs> in the flight number the date and your seat number everything and it I gave like, you the averages yeah. of you dying in a plane crash all oh, right <laughs> it's not and not nice only deal. that he would sit beside rick uh, on the plane did you feel and that say stuff. did you feel that yeah <laughs> To make him get sick at his stomach and nearly throw up on the plane, well, that's too. kind of why David has me here, is just to stir the... It's stir the fire, yeah. <laughs> See what he does? He does it every time. Yes. Well, he knows how. He's always been good at that. <laughs> He's good at it, yes. That's why Earnhardt gave him a hard time and poured the champagne down his... By pulling in his hair, shoved it down in there. Oh, and, by the way, the hair. Yes. Have you ever talked about the bet you had with Tony Stewart? No. Uh, but Jersey... When he Jersey them? Cape yachts, they can be reached at six zero nine nine six five eight six. Now this is a good story. Well, that was just a bet. Yeah, that was a bet, and Phil had really long hair then. Mm-hmm. And what was it? You bet him if he didn't, if he won so many races well, in his it, rookie it, season. You had sent me to cover him when we went to Indy. Okay. And I followed him around his rookie year at Indy, and at the end of the day, I kind of peeked into a office where he was entertaining his friends with his feet up on the desk and i said i'm headed to, i'll see you tomorrow tony and he pointed at me and said that sob i'm going to take him out and get him drunk and cut all his hair off and i said well i hardly ever drink so you'd have a tough time and the his buddies were like edging him on i said i'll do it if you win a race between now and the end of the year it was indy it was august and nobody won a, a race in their rookie year except davy in 88 right yeah. So I figured, well, he's not going to win a race. I said, if you win a race between now and the end of the year, I'll let you cut all my hair off. He won Richmond. And I wasn't home, I wasn't there, but if, after things settled down at Victory Lane, he says, where's Phil at, you know? So I went to Loudon the next week. That's when somebody 
come over to the photo room and said, Deb, we'll need you in the other room. And I come around the corner and I had, remember I had a black sweater on. And as soon as I saw that group of photographers and media and that barber's chair and Tony and all them tools there, I just started breaking out in a sweat. So, yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh crap, it's time and, to cash in. And what made uh, Phil yeah. even more nervous was when he saw the look on my face when Tony started cutting his hair because Tony started and, and went up the middle. <laughs> The back, yeah. Yeah, the back and came up the middle. And Phil looked like an Afton hound yeah. sitting there. That and white stripe up the back. Because yeah, at first I thought he was just teasing me with the back, and then I felt it, and there was yeah. nothing there. Yeah, and, and then when Phil saw the look on my face, he really got sick at his oh, stomach. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. And That's I got sick payback. at my stomach, too. Yeah. That's payback for all the plane harassment. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's all right. I, I was a man of my word, Tony Yes, said. you did. You did it, yeah. Yeah. I would have never been able to cut it, but it was a good time. And Deb, Deb, what was it? A couple years later, you said, "Phil, here, do you want this?" And it was an envelope with a rubber, a plastic bag inside with the hair in it. Hair in it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Hair of the dog. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So we used to uh, joke about getting on that race to express planes, and and we had somebody new there, whatever. And I would say, "You see all that hydraulic oil dripping out the back of the plane." before we got on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sad part is it really was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Hey, so, all right, thank you so much for coming in, Deb. Well, it's thank been, you for having me. It's been great fun. It has been for me, too. It's been a pleasure getting to meet you and hearing your stories because they're really great. I'm sure we could go on for another oh, couple sure. hours at oh, least. Oh, yeah, I could talk racing all day long. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. She could tell you everything about anything you wanted to know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, that's great. And and I don't really have a guest for next week yet. And I may or may not. I may do something. I may put together something. So we'll just wait and see how that goes. And but I do have in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Frank Kimmel. You remember Frank? Oh, yeah. He's going to be coming in. That's great. Yeah. So that'll be in a couple of weeks. Cool. And and I'm going to start doing a little mix up where we have like two guests coming in at one time because you figure the story just kind of like you and Phil together Mm -hmm. telling your stories imagine feed off of each other yeah that's right Mm -hmm. because one makes you think of something else you know yeah exactly right yeah so uh rachel rodman and randy ham says i enjoyed what the little i got to see uh his internet's acting up tonight but oh dear uh, we got this thing now you just got a cell phone turn your wi-fi off and then you can just stream it on your if you have unlimited internet on your phone my phone signal works better than my internet house but kit um, rodriguez said she loves your accent she could listen to it all day yeah oh well thank you that's southern appalachian mountain accent there you go she's she's from new york or somewhere up north yeah they they've been going to pocono every year for like 30 something years now they live in port st Lucie, florida okay we should have hired her as a photographer because i had to listen to deb for 12 years (laughs) all right they're going green this time bye hey (laughs) do you remember what you told me when i sprained my ankle in atlanta Mm-mm. Oh, that was the 2001. Rub some dirt on it? Atlanta, right. No, it was funny. <laughs> oh, I, I sprained it being stupid. Yeah. Um, Robbie Loomis was throwing a Sharpie to Archie Kennedy when I was cutting through the motorhome lot, mm-hmm. and I thought I'd be real smart and jump and intercept it. And oh. I jumped, mm. and I knew when I was in the air I oh. was in trouble. Yeah. And I came down. That's when you'd been up to Rusty Sweet, and you came back down, and you thought I'd hit my head on the pavement oh and they put me on some really high-powered painkillers at the hospital and phil said yeah he could knew what it was going to be like when i was calling the race the next day he was gone gee look at all the pretty lights out there they're all colors there's yellow and green and oh there's a red one (laughs) yeah so so with those 43 guys around was uh, Dale Emmon there to grab you by the arm and yank you up off the ground. Yeah. Uh, oh, Dale Emmon. Dale. What, what, yeah, Dale and I get along great. It was yeah. funny. After we lost Linda Petty, I told Rebecca, I said, now you call me if you need anything. She said, I've got your name and number right here. I'll ask Daddy first. If he can't answer it, I ask Dale. And if Dale can't answer it, I call you. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Dale's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks to uh, Dickie Dennis, of course, and James Smith. And Jim Dooley's up there in Virginia tuning in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Suzette McGuire's out in California. And let's see who else we had join us in the, in the late, I guess. 
And I'm sure Beer Man will get on here eventually. Maybe uh, he might be having a Coors Light or two. Jim by now. Smith. Jim Smith. Rachel All Rogers. right. Jim Smith. Yeah, I remember Jim. He, yep. He retired and moved up to Rochester, New York. Really? Right. Yeah. He's living up there. Sam now. Sharp. I, I was going to ask you, how do I know Sam Sharp? Sam was a photographer with us, yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. I know Sam. <clears throat> yeah. We went to uh, Top Flight, I guess it was, right? Yeah. Sam Not went too with long us. Ago. Oh, okay. You know, played yeah. golf down there, and David was. Killing it. Killing it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He always kills it. I was able to hit a ball about 105 miles an hour, and he was like 160. <laughs> like, what are you doing, man? It was ridiculous. But <laughs> that's, that's, the way, terrible. that's the way I roll out. <laughs> yeah. John Sands out in Arizona. Yeah. Jerry Jordan. I'm not sure where he's at. Well, Jerry, you never know. He's probably in Houston, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah. Well, thanks for Jerry. tuning in. Jerry. I know. Right Jerry's here. a good yeah, he's yeah. Cool. Oh, all these are good people. Yeah, and uh, John Sands. I did say John. You Sands. just said John. Yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. let's see, one more here. Paul Rodriguez. He's down in Port St. Lucie, Florida. So, thank y'all so much for tuning in. If I miss anybody, Rachel Rodman's down in Charlotte. She volunteers with the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Okay. A lot of times. So, yeah. And uh, all right. So after this video goes off, you can watch the premiere of the video that I made, and let me know what you think about it. I think it's pretty cool. It's a, kind of a piece of history. I put some pictures of. Marty Robbins, some with him, with Richard Petty, and different stuff like that. So hopefully you'll enjoy that because uh, I just love the history and I want to keep it keep it going and, and teach exactly. people about it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you need yeah. to learn the history, and mm-hmm. that's you know that's the cool thing about this sport is if you are a reporter covering college football or pro football or you know any of the college sports, mm-hmm. you get to cover an athlete for four years. If you're covering a pro sport, you may get to cover that athlete 10 years. But, man, if you're covering racing, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm in my 40th year. Yeah. You know, I'm getting to cover people's grandsons and sons and Mm -hmm. all that. Uh, And you've got to know what happened previously for it to be relevant today Mm -hmm. for the stories. It's just like when Richard Petty got caught in the 1983 fall race at Charlotte with the left side tires on the right side and the oversized engine. Mm -hmm. And Bobby Allison took up for Richard. You've got to know how Bobby Allison's crew and Richard Petty's crew got in fistfights after the races in the 60s to know what a monumental thing it is that here now B.A. is taking up for Richard. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, and you can say... well, Sonny, back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if anybody uh, uses the term back in the day, I just want to hit them because that doesn't tell me a thing. Oh, uh, yeah. I know it another, tells I, me right. no decade, no year, uh, no era, well, nothing. I know another annoying term that Deb always hated when anybody yeah. called NASCAR the show. The show, okay. You know, I thought of that the other day <laughs> when I was hearing somebody say, I wrote a column on that one time. Did you? I remember yeah. she hated you when you the called circus. it the show or something. No, the show. <laughs> the she did way. not like that No, term. I did. No. I wrote a column on that, yeah. that it was a race. A show yeah. was, and I went through this big, elongated yeah. thing about what a show yeah. was. Yeah. That's just like you taught me one of the greatest lessons at a racetrack. We were at Charlotte walking to the media. Don't get me emotional, but... Oh, I walked okay. by a little boy that tried to get an autograph. Yeah. And I said, I'm nobody. And Deb stopped me. She goes, Phil Cavelli, you're wearing that uniform. You represent this sport. You give yes. that kid that autograph because it will mean the world to that little kid. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you're I thank something. you for that and for so many reasons. Yeah, very you're good. Yeah, thank I you for all you I did. wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have got that job without you because I sweated it. And afterwards, you let me know. No, I told them I wanted you. And I'm like, oh, well, you should have told me that before the interview. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Very good. We had some good times. I miss Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Tremendously. Yeah. I put an extra mirror in the shop for Phil whenever he started getting down. It's like, Phil, go look in that mirror and say, I am somebody. <laughs> I am. I did, but the I mirror cracked. It. And then it cracked. <laughs> <laughs> then he broke. He broke it. Yes. <laughs> All right. And speaking of the show, uh, let's see. Suzette says, love the show, but it's okay to call this a show because it kind of is. It is a show. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's not a race. We're not waving a flag. You know, we don't have caution periods and all that. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and, you know. All right. So Dickie says, um, I don't like it. Uh, the, some, the word playoffs, it doesn't belong in the motorsports. Yeah. You know, um, anybody who remembers Bill Demick, who wrote National Speed Sport and in area auto racing some of the other publications he told me the same thing he said playoffs 
that's a term for stick and ball sports, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not racing. Yeah. Very that's good. Why we have a chase. Well, yeah. now, and in the, in the NHRA, it is the chase for the championship is what the NHRA calls it. And it starts the weekend after the U.S. Nationals in Indy, which is Labor Day weekend. Who do you think is going to win the championship this year in a cup? Cup? Oh, man. Ah, right now I'd have to lay it on Kyle Larson. He's been most consistent, hasn't he? Yeah. 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 I, think he, I mean, that man what? amazes me what he can drive. I always Holy said if they cow. put him in a Hendrick car, he'd be magic, and he's mm -hmm. been delivering. He's mm -hmm. a great kid, too. I thought it was cool when we had the Zoom conference with the 10 – truck drivers that are going for the championship that Stuart Friesen has driven at least 50 dirt track races. He drove five in seven days yep. after Watkins Glen. Yep. How yep. about that? Yeah. I mean, the big block modified yeah. dirt truck cars and all. All right. Dickie yeah. says Harvick and then uh, Jake McVie says Larson. No, Larson, not Harvick. Who's Harvick? Yeah. He's, yeah. <laughs> you drive a car. Well, never mind. Uh, go there. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, we'll see y'all next Monday. But stick around and watch this premiere video. And don't forget to go back, go in the comments and let me know what you think about it. Uh, because that way I know I didn't just waste my time. You actually enjoy it and hit the thumbs up. And hit the thumbs up on this one if hit you like it. Hit the subscribe button. Yes. And if you didn't like it, hit the thumbs up twice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Y'all have a great night. Tune in to the Billy Buck Morning Show tomorrow morning and with a side of ham. I'll be here at 6 a.m. Good night. Welcome to Racing Roots with Ham. If you don't know our host, David Ham, he's a 25-year NASCAR veteran, engine builder, and jackman. Live every Monday evening, we have a new guest. From the racing world with their stories, their paths, their, their racing, racing roots. roots. Sponsored by Jersey Cape Yachts. Real Country 550 and 92.9. WAME and W225BD Statesville. Yes, yeah, summertime means party.